We know that there are, there is a great controversy about your theories, uh, and uh, we know that, uh, at least I have found out in my research, that you have a tremendous number of supporters, and you also have a tremendous number of detractors or critics who say that your theories don't hold up and so forth. So over the period of the next few programs, I want to explore it. The reason we're doing more than one program with you is because it's such a complex subject and there's so many facets. I think it would be unfair to you and to the audience to attempt to, to try to examine the entire spectrum uh, in one 30-minute setting. So tell me what your theory is in terms of disease and how you uh, recommend that disease is treated. I generalized because I saw so many diseases that I was working on to be due to a parasite and a toxin in combination, uh, kind of a collusion between them maybe, that I generalized and said all diseases are due to a combination of some parasite or something that's trying to live on you, even if it's a bacterium, that, that's really a parasite in, in a sense, and a toxin um, maybe a solvent, maybe a heavy metal that's facilitating that, uh, that invader. Give me an example of a disease and an example of the parasite and the pollutant and how they work together to create that disease. Well, the easiest example that comes to mind is diabetes. You have the pancreatic fluke invading the pancreas and probably the islets of Langerhans, which are inside and a pollutant wood alcohol, methyl alcohol, wood alcohol, which pollutes nearly all the processed food that we have on the market in tiny amounts. But by the time you're drinking and eating it all day long with that little bit, it adds up to too much. And that combination I always see in diabetes. That might not be all there is to it, but if you correct those two things, you recover from your diabetes. The 71-year-old scientist and grandmother is the author of several controversial books, The Cure for All Diseases, The Cure for HIV AIDS, The Cure for All Cancers, and The Cure for All Advanced Cancers. Dr. Clark designed the synchrometer to locate and identify toxins, parasites, viruses, and bacteria, and she created the zapper to kill them. Here is a synchrometer, which is a circuit together with this resonance box, which can analyze your tissues without going into you to see what is there. This part of this is the circuit, and it is just a one transistor oscillator. It's a very simple little circuit that you see in many other larger circuits. But it is so simple that I would like people to be able to make this. And that's why I have the instructions for it in the books. The resonance box is attached to it. This is where you put your samples. You would put a sample of your body on one plate and a sample of the item you're testing for on the other plate. And I'm going to show you what it can do. Here are some locations in a person's body. They are called slides, okay? They are uh, samples of a tissue. This one is tooth. This one is lung, and so on. All the different tissues uh, have samples made of them. You can purchase them. They're perfectly safe to use. And that way, you can search in a person's body for whatever toxin or solvent or bacterium or virus or whatever, or parasite, whatever you want to search for. These are the test substances. Uh, toluene is a terrible solvent that goes to the brain. Thallium is a terrible solvent, goes to the nervous system too. Here's an azo dye, Sudan black, another azo dye, fast green found on all your produce that's sprayed, which is nearly everything. Dab, another azo dye that pollutes our food, our produce. And the others might be heavy metals. Here's nickel. 
Here's methyl malonic acid, which causes kidney disease. Here's isopropyl alcohol, which goes with the big parasite, Fasciolopsis buskii. And this is taken from a huge animal, so don't think that this is what you have in you. Uh, but that's where the slide, uh, how the slide was made from a large animal. Ours are much smaller, and they can be as baby size, of course, as small as an egg when it first uh, hatches out. And um, this is the adult, though, of that. And, to, and that, together with this solvent, causes a growth factor to be made called orthophosphotyrosine. And I'll be testing for that. Here is gold, which goes to the pancreas and also causes obesity. Here is DNA, which um, is in overabundance when you have a tumor growing. So by testing for this, you can tell if you have too much of it. Benzene, which uh, we find in all AIDS cases, and uh, in people with terribly, terrible sensitivity to all their foods and the environment, they can hardly stand to live in their own homes full of benzene too, and no longer able to detoxify it. And acrylic acid comes from plastic teeth. It seeps out of plastic teeth when they aren't hard enough and turns into malonic acid and from there to methylmalonate. So, I would like to show you uh, this uh, kind of testing, which is more powerful than an MRI, I think, or a CAT scan, or even an X-ray, even though it doesn't draw a picture. What's best is having both. One of now the, you can do a chemical, make a chemical picture. A chemical picture? Yes. One of your critics said that uh, what you're proposing is preposterous because this is too cheap. Uh, he said the only way you can have good health is, and I mean, I'm almost quoting him as a medical doctor. He said the only way we can have quality health is to have expensive health. And I would change that around to say that the only way we could have quality health is to enable every person for themselves to have such a device so that they could go to the marketplace, figure out which, of the, which produce is, has these azo dyes, which does not, uh, which part of the uh, salad bar has salmonella in it and which does not so that the consumer can make a, a healthy choice. What foods uh, have uh, parasitic contents that you would find adverse to us that would create these diseases? Nearly everything. Nearly all the produce has dirt on it. How could it be otherwise? It was grown in the soil and you can't sterilize them. So the dirt that's on them has parasite eggs and, uh, well, eggs primarily, on it. all different kinds. Uh, roundworms, flatworms, anything you can think of that lives in dirt or is spread through dirt, namely has had animal uh, uh, leftovers in it, uh, is on the food. It's, it's cleaner than if you had just pulled it up, of course, they do wash it, I think, before it leaves the, the farm or the, the big gardens, but, but it has it on it. And the dairy, all the dairy products uh, have, have parasite eggs and stages in them. Now, one of your theories is that we get uh, certain uh, contaminants in bottled water, for example. Yes. Uh, not because the water is not pure, but because the chemicals used to clean the machines. Would you explain that? Yeah, one of the chemicals allowed for, for these things is isopropyl alcohol. Your, your bins and vats and mixing dishes and everything uh, has to, by law, and we do need it sterile, you know, uh, be cleaned with something that sterilizes it. I'm not against sterilizing anything. We need it sterilized. But when you use chemicals, and are required to leave the, the bins wet. That's a legal requirement. You may not rinse it out. You would prefer the public to drink tap water? Yes, from the cold side, of course, because that hasn't gone through your heating system, but it is by far the better water. Are the chemicals in the municipal water? Yes, there are, but the levels are pretty low, and it is far better than drinking solvents in 
uh, in bottled water. You must drink traces of whatever was used to sterilize that bottle and the machinery to pump it all. And that is often a solvent. With regard to uh, um, what we eat, you're proposing a pretty draconian adjustment in life. And that is uh, in order to look at pollutants. And normally when we say the environment or pollution, we think of the, of the sky, or we think of the air. You really are talking about the elements in our environment, our furniture, the things that we use to clean our homes with, detergents. You're talking about the clothes we wear, the dry cleaning. And you're talking about uh, things as simple as um, getting your hair colored or tinted. It would be pretty easy to take those special toxic things out. And I'm hoping that that's what will happen. It's just that we have an inertia about us, uh, at least commercially, the, 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 the manufacturers have an inertia about them not wanting to change. But it w you wouldn't be changing to a draconian lifestyle. You can have nearly everything that's out there if it would just be cleaned up. You see, they did uh, ban uh, azo dyes in food products uh, decades ago, but I find traces of azo dyes in our foods, nearly all our processed foods. By nearly all, I mean about 95% of everything I test, and I test probably uh, 10 to 50 items a day, which no. turns into thousands. You know, nearly everything is polluted with azo dyes. And I did pursue that. I was shocked with that. We did check with the FDA, some personnel there, who, who, who gave me quite an education that nobody is testing for azo dyes in foods because they are illegal. Well, why would a manufacturer run that risk if they are illegal? They aren't being put there. They're, they get in as a pollutant. The body, the liver has to mobilize its special systems of detoxification, which were only meant to be used occasionally. Now you have to, we're like alcoholics. Alcohol uses a special system of detoxification. Now we're using so many products and, and uh, odd foods and um, artificial foods that the liver has to detoxify. I think that's it, but that's just a theory. That isn't something that I've observed. That is a theory of mine, that that's why the liver is behaving so poorly. I am testing myself as well as doing a control for the test that I'm about to do. Identical. Positive. So there's something on this plate that is identical with something on this plate. I don't think there's any other instrument ever invented that could do that. It makes it very powerful to be able to detect things, whether they're bacteria or viruses or toxic substances or your metabolites. You can search your metabolism and that's been fascinating to see how your body works how a virus, for instance, is incorporated. Uh, what happens to the HIV virus or herpes virus or other viruses that we eat or, or get somehow? Uh, we know how to kill them, but are they really gone? So we can put your chromosomes, a sample of chromosomes on one plate and a sample of the virus here and see whether it really isn't gone whether it's still hiding in your chromosomes. And we call that a latent virus, like herpes. In other words, we know, we've been taught that, and you know from experience, that once you have herpes, you always have herpes. It doesn't go away. As soon as you trigger it, it comes out. But we can detect which chromosome that herpes virus is in. Is there any danger to her from that circuit going through her body? No. I've never seen any side effect. Of course, the voltage is very small. It's about uh, maybe there's a nine volt battery in here. What's coming out is about four and a half to six volts. Um, and that's all we need to pick up 
on the internal organs of her body. It would seem that your theory is the antithesis of traditional medical practice. Why are you not critical of medical doctors? They are doing their best. They are scientists in their training. They can't apply their science. The system isn't made, they, they have to fit into their system and it isn't made so that they can apply their uh, scientific training. They have to go by the protocols already in place for them and they have to um, abide by that or, or, or lose their licenses or somehow no longer be in that profession. How, how does the traditional practice of medicine differ from what you do? As night and day. I would look at a blood test and I immediately can see that here is a slightly high BUN, blood urinary uh, urea, blood nitrogen urea. Uh, and that lets me know that there's a high level of bacteria in that person. Yet a clinician would look at that and say, oh, it's not important yet. Uh, it's not over the top. It's not out of range at the high side. Yet I know that we have to go after some bacterial invasion. Now, there may be uh, an especially uh, diligent doctor who thinks that since it's near the top, you, sh you should go after it. And, the, and, and, and they have been trained to think that such a, a BUN value represents failing kidneys. So they would go after kidney support. Whereas my synchrometer data has shown me that it is not a kidney problem, that it's a bacterial invasion problem. And it's very easy to find which bacteria they are. You solve it in less than a week. Are you saying that your orientation is cure and the medical profession's orientation is treatment of symptoms? Is, is that yes, correct? Yes, I do. I'm, I think that is the correct distinction. Because if you are, uh, uh, finding the real underlying causes of some uh, illness or lack of wellness, uh, then I think you're on the road to finding the cure. That it's a process difference. If you are looking for something that makes you feel better, makes the symptoms go away, you are looking for a treatment. Now this is at the heart of where your critics are. Uh, we're going to talk later extensively about your approach to cancer in particular and to what we call AIDS in particular. But they say that the people who uh, leave you, that you call cured, aren't cured because you don't see them again. Whereas in conventional medicine, they have a five-year window. And if, if there's a recurrence within five years, they don't call it a cure. Well, take an example. Supposing your disease, all disease, was a whole bunch of little red bumps, itchy bumps, say around your ankles and around your waist. And you gave uh, some kind of a lotion that instantly made them disappear. Um, it would be maybe a treatment, but supposing you found a cause and effect, like I would, and that made them disappear. And the person turned out to be flea bites. Okay, say I found it was flea bites. They didn't find what it was, but they got rid of the symptoms. I have a, uh, hypothetically, I have a um, benign tumor. Bottom line, we should or should not be concerned about a benign tumor. We should be very concerned. Why? Because it tells us that we now have a dozen things in us that enables us to make tumors. Uh, and that one little one that we first see gives us that uh, information. It's the warning bell. And at that stage, we should begin to do what? Clean up. Clean up what? Our bodies? Get those dozen things that I find in all tumors out of us. How do we do that? You kill parasites because several parasites are involved. You get rid of all the dye colored food, colored beverages, uh, and colored hair dye. Okay, you could get rid of that. You, you stop eating asbestos. 
Stop now, eating e asbestos. Eating asbestos. It's a much more important thing than stopping to breathe it. We're eating it in all our produce. And we have to learn how to wash it off. It's pretty easy, but you have to do it. You have to stop having magnetic metals in your mouth. Stop sucking on metal. Now, why should we get the mercury out of our mouths? There's a very big contribution of metal, toxic metal, to cancer, tumor growth. And with such a bad uh, association to metal, it seems to me just obvious that we shouldn't be sucking on it all day, which is what we do to our tooth filling. Well, how would you recommend that we uh, uh, clean our bodies? In other words, if we have a warning sign or we don't have a warning sign, we just yes. want to practice self-health. Uh, we want to have good health. What do we do? What You have a liver kidney cleanse program, do you not? You do this ancient uh, treatment whereby you cause the liver to push out what is in the bile ducts. And it should, of course, be bile, but often it's such poor bile, it isn't even green. And it's full of crystals, cholesterol crystals. It's an easy way to get rid of a lot of cholesterol. Ball stones? Yes, uh, that too. They're not the kind of stone that you might get out of the gallbladder when you've had surgery for stones. They look different and have and are calcified. Now, let's go back to the cleansing. We want to cleanse our kidney and we want to cleanse our liver. Yes, but it is better to do a kidney cleansing first because when your kidneys are in good shape and you've increased your water consumption to help them along, then the liver cleanse, which, which gives you a gush of all this terribly foul and toxic um, material from the bile ducts won't affect won't affect your body so much see what you pull out of the liver this very toxic stuff can spread into your bodies you know out come bacteria and viruses too uh, and if you have a good elimination system especially the kidneys then you never have a problem with it you don't feel sick. Now the liver is the organ that really discharges the toxins and the poisons from our body. So therefore, if the liver is not working, we're in, yes. we're at the last, with we're in real serious trouble. Yes. Now, how do you, what are your steps? What do we use? For the kidney cleanse, I picked about a half a dozen of herbs that are easily available. You can order them easily, that are known already back to antiquity to help the kidney. Some of them dissolve kidney stones, not all of them. And some of them relieve pain in the kidney. Some are diuretic, which is very good for you. That makes you some, discharge your yes, liquids from your body. Yes, and you're supposed to drink a lot with it, and you have, uh, in a way, cleaned up your filtering system, which is your kidney. And, you know, say for a car filter, once it's clogged, it doesn't work very well and you have to get a new one. Well, now you, you're real, real high on uh, black green walnut hulls. That's a herb. Yes. And in combination with uh, two other herbs, what are they? Cloves and wormwood. Uh, those three. Yes. Would you repeat them for me, please? Uh, they're the green hull of the black walnut tree nut and the cloves just the same as you cook or bake with. And wormwood, which is an ancient uh, anti-parasite uh, treatment. Uh, those three. Now, I did some research, I've done a lot of research, and, and it verifies that there is research, a body of research, uh, as to the scientific usefulness of those three herbs. That doesn't mean that in combination they're going to do what you say, but there is some scientific uh, uh, history for of those three herbs. What do those three in combination do to the body, for the body? It kills parasites on nearly all the parasites that I ever tested for, which was around 80 or 90 different parasites it kills. It does not kill toxoplasma because it's intracellular 
does not kill candida because that gets to be intracellular. For those who don't know, that's right. uh, yeast overgrowth. Right. Women in There are a number of things it does not kill, but when it can kill nearly all of the common parasites that that uh, are you know have a fleshy <laughs> body to them that we find so loathsome, uh, that's what it does. Do you make the claim that using those three herbs in combination cures cancer? No, I don't. I say that those three herbs in combination plus an electrical treatment is the right uh, cure of a malignancy. How, how are you so certain that, that each time you have cured the person? We use scanning techniques and we do blood tests. Um, you can tell if a tumor has shrunk or not. It isn't difficult to see if the blood test improved or not. But I realized this kind of criticism would come along and that's why I saved 50 sets of, of x-rays before and after and all the blood tests and that's what I published in the last book. Now this is where you really go head on with your critics. Because when you use the word cure cancer, uh, I mean, some, of them, the some of them go ballistic. I've got yeah. a ton of things here from the internet. Yeah. Uh, and they say that's just crazy. They call you bad names. They say it's not good medicine. It's bad information for it's the public. It's not good medicine. That's certainly true. But it is good cause and effect, a pursuit of cause and effect. The zapper can kill viruses too but it doesn't reach into the chromosomes. It, it is an electrical device that doesn't detect or measure. It just puts out a pulse of a certain frequency. The frequency is not very important. Uh, it's set, this one is set lower than the one that I usually use. Mine is usually 30,000 hertz cycles per second. 30k. This one might be somewhat lower, but it doesn't matter very much. You hold these two handles and you turn it on. This isn't one of our varieties. There are quite a few zapper makers um, now and you can get a variety of zappers. You sit there holding it for about seven minutes on our model. A nine might be even better. Then you give yourself a rest for about 20 minutes because what's happening is that lots of viruses are coming out of the parasites and bacteria, I don't know which, that you killed. I don't know if the virus is coming from the bacteria or the parasites, but we get a flood coming out after the first zap. Then you do a second zap of another seven minutes or nine minutes. I have a... Um benign tumor. I was worried. Uh, I found a lump in my breast, the woman would say. Uh, I had a biopsy. We found out that it was not uh, malignant. Should I be celebrating? Yes, because it hasn't progressed to the point of malignancy. But you shouldn't be celebrating very hard very long because you are at great risk for developing a malignancy in it. This uh, parasite the Fasciolopsis buskii stages will invade such a benign tumor. And after it gets going for a while, the tumor becomes malignant. The benign tumor is a much more complicated thing than the malignancy. And I, I worked for five years now working out uh, what causes the benign tumor. It's a whole different thing. It's really uh, mostly due to a bacterium. And so I call it the tumor forming bacterium, Clostridium. It's a family of bacteria called Clostridium. See, there are about, about a dozen causes. You don't just kill this fluke parasite and other parasites. There are other additional causes. There is fungus growth there, and bacterial growth, and oncoviruses are growing there too. And we have to kill them all. And when we do that and remove the major toxins, there are about three, that's all. Altogether, a dozen isn't really that very much. And if we remove all that, the tumor shrinks. And have you worked with anyone who you said, Tony, if you want to get rid of that uh, cancer, 
these are the five things that I want you to do. And if you do these five things, uh, I believe that the cancer malignancy will go away. Well, I do three of them. I don't do all five of them. So then my cancer doesn't go away. And then can I legitimately say to you, your treatment really doesn't work? No, you can't legitimately do that. Body uh, does appreciate your help very much. If you do, if you're in an early stage of cancer and you're still pretty healthy and you do half the things that I say you need to do, very often the body just takes hold and devours that whole tumor. Uh, nickel, according to your book, is often found in the prostate of a male. Yes. Uh, nickel comes primarily from soil. No, although there's plenty of nickel in the soil, nickel comes primarily from your watch band, your metal glasses frames, and most of all, from metal tooth fillings. Now, it also favors a particular kind of parasite. If it's, uh, if it's going to be hypertrophy leading to tumor formation and cancer, then it's always fasciolopsis. What parasitic name would you give kidney disease? I don't know a parasite for that, but the toxin is methyl malonic acid. Methyl malonate is the toxin. That derives from plastic. There is also, I think, an endogenous source that I don't ha don't haven't studied enough yet. But plastic in your teeth is what makes methyl malonate. All kinds of liver disease is just a whole big collection of parasites in the liver. And the liver has lost its immunity. That's why you're getting hepatitis C and other liver diseases. By loss of immunity, I mean the same two things I mentioned before. Asbestos eating has caused a coating of the white blood cells with ferritin. And the other immune lowering cause is magnetic metals. When you eat magnetic metals like thulium, gadolinium, lanthanum, erbium, terbium, 15 of them, magnetic metals, they ruin your white cell's ability to move around. The white cell has to be able to see its enemy and it has to be able to move around with great mobility to get its pseudopods out there to grab the enemy. Those are the two main functions. And when you knock that out with asbestos eating and knock it out with lanthanide eating, the magnetic metals, you have a loss of immunity and that organ will fail. Alzheimer's disease. Yes. And the parasite, is that flukes? Fasciolopsis, flukes. Now, the Fasciolopsis buski is, also, is what kind of fluke? Is, is a fluke? It's a fluke, yes, meaning a flatworm. It's a leech. It's a tiny leech. And uh, what uh, pollutant is that with? Uh, xylene and toluene, two solvents that are getting more and more prevalent in our food and beverages, processed food. Over the years, we have presented programs debating whether HIV is the true cause of AIDS. Renowned virologist Dr. Peter Duesberg says that the so-called AIDS epidemic in Africa is actually caused by malnutrition and parasitic infections. 28,000 Americans dying a year of, of this. Now, we are told that there's just no way we can cure AIDS, but you're saying that you can. We could do it very quickly. We need to take the benzene out of our food supply and, and product supply. And probably for Africa, I think it's in their water supply. Tony Brown Productions produces this program and is solely responsible for its content.